Good afternoon, everyone. And we'd like to welcome you to the webinar hosted by CPA, the Association for Contract Packagers and Manufacturers. And today we're highlighting an exciting story of automation. Today's session is titled, Packaging with Cobots, a Success Story. I am Ron Puvac, the Managing Director of CPA. And I'd like to just walk you through very briefly who CPA is. Ben, would you send the next slide, please? Thank you. The CPA has been the voice for contract packagers and manufacturers since 1992. We engage in providing knowledge and expertise within the contract packaging industry, and we try to raise the profiles of uh, the contract packagers and, and, and their capabilities. Next slide, please. Again, just a little bit of statistics. Uh, we have an RFQ tool, request for quotation tool on our website. It's free for anybody to use. If you need help, we're happy to help you. You can lose at our member directory. We have a lot of networking opportunities, up to 10 events a year. We do a lot, have a lot of training opportunities for folks. And also, just to let you know, we're growing at a rate of actually 12.2% per for the last five years as an industry. Next slide, please. So we invite you to join us one way or the other. Uh, we, as if you're a contract package or manufacturer, you can obviously be a member. And if you're a supplier, you can be an associate member. If you are a brand or an entrepreneur, we invite you to come and visit us at PAC Expo. You can come to our annual meetings, things like that. And it's just a few of the things we have as member benefits. But again, thank you so much for attending today. All right, Ben, uh, next slide, please. All, all of you are on mute. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, you'd like to get an answer, please use the question box, type it in. We'll get this to as many as we can. This webinar is being uh, recorded and will be posted on CPA website at contractpackaging.org within a few days. At the end of the webinar, you will see a link for a very brief survey. Please provide us your feedback. It's terribly important to have that. So a little bit today, uh, I would like to uh, uh, introduce our presenter. I'm gonna let him do some of his own uh, introduction. Ben Courtright is a sales development man and manager at Pacific Northwest Universal Robots. Ben is a subject matter expert on food and beverage and several other areas, and also our subject matter expert on collaborative robots. Ben, please take it away. Thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. We're very excited to present uh, this awesome case story uh, out of Oregon uh, with Derex. And uh, I wanna thank you, Ron, and uh, the CPA for having me here. Uh, very excited, so uh, we'll kick things off here. So the agenda today, we're gonna briefly touch on market trends that are driving changes in packaging, uh, who Derex is and the stakeholders uh, involved that made this project a success, how they implemented their collaborative robot, the reasons they were successful and the return on investment Derex has seen since implementing uh, their collaborative robots and then where Derex is looking next um, in their facility for collaborative robots. About myself, uh, Ron touched on this a little bit. I'm the uh, sales development manager responsible for the Pacific Northwest with Universal Robots. I currently reside in Portland, Oregon. Uh, for anybody who hasn't been there, terrible place to live. Uh, do not move there. Do not recommend it. <laughs> been with you are since early january 2018 uh so coming up on uh two years here and then uh major industries that i work in in the northwest are aerospace electronics and food and beverage so we're going to cover here the challenges of today's market environment product variation and customization into uh high mix low volume i'm sure a lot of you are seeing this uh, from your customers or in your own facility is that you're going from a small quantity of SKUs to a large quantity of SKUs with lower volumes, which requires uh, less fixed automation and more flexible automation. Electronics, shorter uh, product life cycles. Everybody wants the newest iPhone. Uh, so, and that trend is kind of uh, went into other areas as well within electronics and even other industries. So always having the newest goods and everybody wants the newest thing on trend. Um, precision and consistency, as products get smaller, you need to be more precise. You need to have the products packed in the same place, same orientation every single time with very little uh, variation in your box or on your pallet. So having a, a system in place that can achieve that is crucial nowadays. Customer delivery or customer trends, faster delivery. 
So everybody wants everything yesterday. You need to be able to scale up for large scale orders and have uh, automation in place that can address those challenges, especially within this hiring environment, which we'll uh, touch on with Derek here shortly, which was a huge aspect for them when looking at automation and uh, which uh, collaborative robot to move forward with. So here, all these things together kind of add up to the following six installations into relocatable uh, uh, assets. So putting a collaborative robot on a movable carton, moving it between line one and line two throughout the day and having to do different tasks or 10 different lines as your needs change. Uh, without human interaction into frequent interaction and uh, shared space. So having humans work in conjunction with collaborative robots to achieve the desired uh, throughputs. Repetitive work into frequent changes. So having lots of SKU changes, uh, product changes, line changes, having an asset that you can relocate like a flex worker uh, along different lines to achieve your, your needed throughputs. Long-term ROI into short-term ROI. This is something I'll touch on with uh, the Derek's case study here in a second, but um, we're seeing very, very short return on investments from collaborative robots in the field right now because of the relocatable uh, aspects of them because they do not require a cage around them. So now I'm gonna touch on who Derek's is. Derek's is a small family owned manufacturer in Southern Oregon that makes drill and knife sharpeners. Roughly 100 employees, depending on the time of year, uh, very seasonal. Uh, located in a small rural community, uh, very, very difficult to find labor down there. It's extremely competitive. There's a strong ag industry, and then there's a large university in town as well that hires away a lot of people. So uh, they experience a lot of turnover, which really affects them during the, the busy times of year, uh, especially around Christmas and that sort of thing. And so being able to scale for those production runs uh, has been very difficult for them. And so that's what led them into looking at automation and exploring uh, which projects they wanted to tackle so they could really start ramping up for some of these larger scale orders they're experiencing and keep on with their, their growth demands. The stakeholders involved in this project, kind of from the top down, you have Matthew. He's a present owner, third generation owner, uh, needs to address labor shortage in his company um, and improve employee satisfaction. There's a lot of tedious jobs within that manufacturing facility. And so finding automation that's friendly towards his workers and, and kind of kills two birds with one stone there, addresses a labor shortage and improves the overall satisfaction of his workers by eliminating a very tedious position and moving them to something more rewarding. John, the director of operations, is then tasked by Matthew to increase production quantities and reduce scrap. So he needs to look at automation to increase his capacity and reduce the amount of scrap parts that are, that are coming back because of misaligned screws or not torqued properly, etc. Sam, the manufacturing engineer, has a limited bu budget to work with and experience with automation. Uh, they had very little automation in their facility going into these projects, and so that was a, a large factor in this, is that they needed something that they could start small with and build their skill set from there. Project scope that was identified. Matthew, the owner of company, identified that his company is facing a critical labor shortage and needed to adopt automation to address the problem. He tasked John, the director of operations, to put together a project to reduce some of the repetitive tasks like screw driving, case erecting, case packing, uh, palletizing, take a look at those and what is the lowest hanging fruit that they could identify, which would be a fast return on investments and a quick win for them. As a common thing we look for, uh, when talking to companies about collaborative robots is what is the low hanging fruit application that might not have the three month return on investment that something down the line has, but is the quickest win and you can get it in there the fastest to start making that impact immediately instead of a few months from now because there's more, uh, there's more work that needs to be done for some of these harder projects. And so from this point, John and Matthew started researching uh, automation and what really fits their needs and their, their experience and something that they could take ownership of and start small with. And uh, they came across Universal Robots and uh, got connected with the local distributor. And what's, what's nice about collaborative robots in general is that it's a very, very low entry level uh, piece of automation. You can start very, very small, very simple, and build your skill set from there. And Derek is a prime example of that. You'll see here in a second that they started small with a screw driving application 
And then over time, with their experience of having the, the cobot in there, is that they were able to build into something very complex end of line of having a single robot do case directing and case packing in in one in one cell. So really, from there, it's something that's phenomenal to see that that skill set build because of uh, the ease ease of use that our cobots provide and, and cobots in general. And like I said, the first application that took place was the screw driving with a UR3. So here you can see an example of it in their facility. They have the uh, the uh, sharpener bodies that come down the line. Robot drives in uh, three screws. It's bowl fed. Um, Fairly straightforward application, uh, but it reduced the main uh, aspect here was reducing a, a tedious job of driving those screws in. And then uh, workers were not driving them in properly every time. So they were having a lot of issues with uh, scrap parts and that sort of thing, or those having to come back and be reworked. So putting the cobot into the line there has completely reduced their scrap parts because it does it the same every single time. Keys to success. After the implementation of the screw driving uh, application, Derex went to the end of line packaging and case directing. Sam, the manufacturing engineer, was responsible for sourcing and implementing the automation for this project. Sam had very little experience with automation at this point, and so he really relied on doing a lot of research and working with the local distribution partner uh, for Universal Robots to. Uh, you know, learn from their experiences with other customers and what products they recommend that work in conjunction uh, with our collaborative robots. He was able to use his experience from screw driving to build upon his skill set with UR. He uh, used our online academy to uh, continue to learn how to program and get more uh, self-sufficient on the collaborative robots. He sourced more conveyors, a checkware, and he even 3D printed his own end effector for case erecting. He even made his own in-feed for case directing. For this application, the robot was actually the easiest part of the application. The hardest part was sourcing and, you know, putting together the conveyors, the check wear, the uh, case sealer, and building and designing the in-feed for his boxes for case directing so they're in the same repeatable position every single time. This is something that we see with most applications within the collaborative robot world is that the robot is usually the easy part. It's the stuff around it that can be a little more complicated. How your how your boxes are presented, what's the orientation of your product that you're putting into your case, where does the box go after it's filled? Do you push it through a case sealer? Does a worker come over and tape it? You know, those aspects are usually the uh, the hurdle. Or, you know, what does my end effector look like to grab the product or grab the the part to put into this box? And Sam was able, a nice aspect about the robot is that Sam was able to use the UR as a master controller for the entire end of line system instead of a PLC. So he was able to connect uh, the conveyor and the uh, case sealer to the controller and was able to have them communicate with each other to know, you know, when a box is full and to push it through, let the case sealer know that a box can be coming through the case sealer. Here's an overview of the complete line here at the end of line. So you can see a the five kilogram collaborative robot there front and center. It has a pneumatic end effector on there that Sam actually 3D printed, uh, which I was very impressed with, is that it actually has a solenoid hinge on there. So that solenoid hinge allows you, if you watch the case study on YouTube, um, so if you go onto YouTube and look up Universal Robots Derex, you can watch the full video here, but you'll see that the robot goes over to the stack of boxes, grabs it off in that, that solenoid hinge there, comes onto the side of the box and is able to pull the box open and then it puts it on to the slide there to close the bottom flaps of the box and then it's stationary there while uh, boxes of product come down the line to the check wear and it's either it's a go or no go. If it's a no go, a work, there's a light that goes on that tells a worker to come over and grab the case if it wasn't the correct weight. If not, the robot grabs it, puts it into a box. Once there is four into the master case, the robot then uses the solenoid to push down one of the flaps, and then it pushes it through the 3M uh, case sealer, which then it goes kind of like a horseshoe down to the end of the line, where it is then or put onto a pallet by a worker at the end of line. This whole system, uh, the robot was sourced very quickly. The rest of the stuff was just waiting on conveyors 
and the case sealer and finishing up design on his infeed for the boxes to then assemble it. But it was a very fluid process and has been a very efficient line for them. The results from this line that we've seen so far at Derex, significant ROI from their packaging system. The ROI for the entire line, including the UR5, was slightly under a year, which is uh, very impressive considering all the hardware that was required uh, for that line. And it, the system has allowed them to scale their manufacturing from uh, two days a week to four days a week for uh, the designated part numbers on that line, which really has allowed them in the busy times of the year to build more quickly and uh, fill those larger orders that come in around the, uh, the Christmas time and fill gaps um, that they have within their, their manufacturing process because of labor shortages. And then one of the best aspects that I like of this is that they are able to retask the employee that was on the end of line there to be the robot supervisor for the main day shift. There's a online academy that we have called Universal Robots Academy where you can go online and learn how to program for free. They had their workers on each shift that were doing this go online, do the online academy, and then the uh, woman who, who won uh, the programming contest, she became the robot supervisor for that shift. This is Brittany. She's the robot supervisor. She knows how to do basic programming. She can recover the, the uh, collaborative robots from a stop for any reason and get them uh, going so you don't have to pull Sam out to, to work on them. Very self-sufficient in that aspect. If there's anything that happens with the robots, like a, a box is rejected on the check wear, she can come over and grab it. Um, she'll fill in and load the pallet as needed, move the pallet to the warehouse when it's full. Um, so really, it's just a flexible worker that can supervise these robots and make sure they're always running at, at full capacity and there's no downtime because any downtime is uh, lost revenue for the company. What's next for Derex? So a few slides ago, I showed the overall cell. At the end of line on the top of the page there, you can see where the boxes are palletized. That's a key area that they're working on implementing here within the next fiscal year is implementing a large uh, UR10, so a 10 kilogram robot to palletize um, onto that pallet there to eliminate Brittany having to come over and, and help as needed to palletize boxes once they stack up there. So making it a more automated system. And then they're looking at replicating this line throughout their facility to address the continued labor shortages they're seeing within their facility. And I thank you for uh, letting me present this case study to you guys today. Um, this was a, it's been a phenomenal application from Derek's and they're seeing continued success. I would say the key takeaways for me from Derek's is that really was having the buy-in from Matthew and John all the way down to Sam that this was something that wasn't kicked around for a long time. It was something that they executed on quickly and efficiently and didn't, and didn't kick around uh, for a year before finally pulling the trigger. And so they saw immediate benefits because of how quickly they moved. So now I'll uh, kick it over to Ron for any questions. Thank you, Ben. Excellent job. I appreciate that. And also, I just want to make mention, Ben gave us the case study. We focused on app specific application. If you needed more information about Collaborative Robots in general, we decided not to do that at this webinar. We have an earlier webinar that has that, plus Ben has information uh, on their universal robot sites for that. But we do have some questions coming in. It's kind of interesting. And I guess the first one is, is one is probably near and dear. Do I need a programmer to program these? Uh, you know, what level of education? You know, you so said there was somebody on the line. That program. Give us a sense, you know, the audience here, you know, how sophisticated a person do you need to do this programming? Yeah, absolutely. So something that's really nice about collaborative robots um, is that the they're all inherently easy to use, or at least most of them, you know, that are commercially available on the market, um, especially the, the universal robots. Um, it's down to almost an operator level right now that you can learn how to program these. And so like Derek, for example, yes, Sam did the majority of the programming on this, but using the, he didn't go to any form of, you know, in-person training or anything like that. It was all something he went online and did our, our free online academy to learn how to program these. It takes about 90 minutes. And from there, he used the skills he built online in, in a simulated environment to use on his robots and, and really, you know, be self-sufficient from there because our collaborative robots, the majority of them on the market don't require any sort of code to program them. So it's all 
um, you know, moving the robot by hand to different positions and setting waypoints, which are locations in space. And so that lack of having to write code really brings it down to a less sophisticated level of experience required to program them. Like Brittany, for example, who's the robot supervisor, she had zero robotics experience going into it or even automation experience. And she was just a, a, an operator and she was able to really build her skill set and gain a, a new uh, resume item. Okay. Excellent. Um, you said ro these robots don't need cages. How safe are collaborative robots? And how, how do you say that they're, you don't need cages? What, what is the mechanism to help keep them safe for workers? Is Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So collaborative robots are uh, force and speed limiting robots. So within the uh, joints of this robot, there's uh, the servos that are always monitoring the uh, current of the robot. So when the robot's in movement, um, it feels that resistance against it, and it's a, a triggered stop that when it gets to a certain level of force against the robot, it, it triggers a protective stop where the robot kind of pauses, and that creates a pop-up with on the, uh, the interface screen or the teach pendant of the robot where the programming is done, letting you know the robot's in a protective stop, and you have to go over and enable it to be able to continue its, its program from there. Um, and r the robots also, they're... Um, they're lower payload than a lot of industrial robots that are on the market currently. So like Universal Robots, our largest robot commercially available is 10 kilograms. And so that's a, a lot lower weight than what you see in the uh, industrial world where it can go up to hundreds of pounds. So um, a lot less weight you have to worry about there. And you can actually regulate on the robot how safe it is. So you can have it extremely restrictive where it takes only, you know, a brief touch to stop it. Um, or you can have it, you know, uh, least restrictive where um, it will still stop on a dime, but it requires a little more force. So that allows you to really, based on your risk assessment, regulate what speeds with the robot you want to move at and what forces are required to stop it. But at the most, you know, it's it's like a small bump when the robot hits you in the, you know, in the shoulder or in the waist. You know, it doesn't leave a bruise or anything like that. Okay, and you, you've got a good point. You mentioned about the size. You talked about a five kilogram or ten kilogram. How do you size a robot? Is it application based, or what do you? What, how, how do you do that? Yeah, it's application based. So there's a lot of uh, applications that pop up, especially within the packaging world, where your product might be one to two kilograms, but you need uh, you need the our our largest size, the UR10, because it's got a 1.3 meter reach. Mm. So the the different size usually as you go up in size with robots usually there's a bigger reach involved with it. So sometimes people are listing very light products, but you need that, that reach to get into the case. Okay. So it's really about looking at your application and then identifying how heavy is the product that we're lifting and what is the distance from where we could mount the robot to where it needs to drop the product. Okay. Here's another interesting one, and it's all about technology as you started off. What essentially is the life cycle of a robot. When do they become obsolete and you've got to replace a, a robot? If I spend the money for this one, how long can I expect it to, to last before I have to replace it? Yeah, absolutely. So most, uh, or I will say all uh, robot companies on the market don't publish any sort of uh, mean time to, to failure or anything like that because it varies so much from application to application um, across the board. So our robots are spec and rated and designed for 35,000 hours of continuous use. So that's what they're spec for. But if you're using our robots 24 hours a day, seven days a week with full 10 kilograms and very fast, jerky, high accelerations, uh, fast decelerations, you're probably going to experience a, a shorter life than somebody that's using it five days a week, slower motions, lower payloads. So it really just depends on the amount of abuse the robot's seen. Um, it's hard to give an exact number, but that's something where uh, working with us in, in local distribution, we can help make sure your program is running efficiently as possible to minimize uh, the amount of stress that the joints are experiencing. Okay. Here's another good question, and you know this one was common. Uh, what kind of budgets do you need to have to implement, let's say, a basic collaborative robotic program, kind of like what Derek's did or something similar? Can you give us any guidelines on that? 
Yeah, I can't. I can't for say, sure say how much Derek's Derek's line cost them because I don't have the exact numbers right now on how much the the case sealer and the the check weigher and those those conveyors cost them. But I would say if you're doing a similar packaging application with them for with a UR five a five kilogram robot, I would say budgeting sixty to seventy thousand would probably be sufficient just for the the robot, the hardware, and potentially the uh, the check wear plus conveyor there to to get that set up. Okay, that's a good number. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, what's another one here? Oh yeah, how um, in the world of automation? That's where we kind of started this whole thing off in automation. Where do you make the judgment to automate, let's say, a machine that you have versus putting in a robot? Is there a template, a worksheet, or something you guys have, or somebody has to say, "Hey, this is when you can automate the machine versus you know putting in a collaborative robot." Yeah, absolutely. I would say the easiest way to identify it is to look at your, especially within the packaging world, look at your throughput. If your throughput is very uh, low mix, high volume, you would probably want to you know go towards a fixed fixed asset at that point that's dedicated machine in the floor can just do, you know, a couple products very, very quickly. If you have a higher mix where you need something more flexible with, uh, you know, lower product volume so you can have a little bit slower speeds, that's where I go towards a collaborative robot where you can, you can have the flexibility of having it move a little slower, but it gives you the capability to move it around your facility and, and have it work on different lines and different tasks. Okay. All right, here's a good question. Somebody's interested in kind of getting more information and getting started on, you know, collaborative robots. How does somebody get started? You know, what was, what's the jump off point? What are the information they need to get started? Yeah, absolutely. So I would really recommend um, going on to the Universal Robots website. Uh, we have a lot of good white pages on there um, with different information on how to get started. It's all right on the homepage, how to get started. Um, you know, hurdles that people have had to overcome within different industries like packaging, palletizing, uh, machine tending, that sort of thing. And then if, you know, after reading those, if that's something that interests you, either go online and do our uh, free online academy or even um, reach out to us directly via the website. There's, uh, you know, put in your contact information. We'll contact you and uh, t chat to you about your application and, and, you know, needs and that sort of thing and move from there. Okay, great. And you talked about the online training. There's a question here. You know, how do you access the online training? Is it, you know, once you become a customer, you get access to the training systems or what? Tell me, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the wonderful thing about the online academy is that you could go online and you don't have to be a customer. You could go online and do it for free today. Um, you know, tens of thousands of people have, have done it worldwide. It's great. It takes about 90 minutes and we actually have two different portions of the academy now we have the basic academy that takes you literally from getting the robot out of the box to um, doing programming on a simulated uh, pick and place off a conveyor line in 90 minutes and then we have a pro track which teaches you how to do a little more complicated things like polishing or uh, palletizing and that sort of thing all within a simulated environment so those skills you learn once you go hands-on in, in the real life with a, a robot live everything's going to look familiar to you and you're going to be able to hit the ground running. So it's completely free to do uh, at any time for people. Just go onto our website, Universal Robots Academy. Very straightforward. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's good advice. We'll have to make sure we include those links on the follow-up. So, Ben, thank you very much. Uh, definitely appreciate your time today. Thank all of you who are attending the webinar. We uh, definitely appreciate it. Again, there will be a short survey that comes out as soon as you log off today. We close out the webinar. Please take it. It's about one or two questions, and we'll answer it. Uh, ben, thank you again, and uh, good day, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you very much, everyone.